Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. Uh, my name is Julian Huppert, and I have the great pleasure of being director of the Intellectual uh, Forum and getting to run a whole range of amazing events through the year. This is actually the last of our public events for the year, so it's great to have you with us. Whether you are here in this wonderful Frank Pan Hall or you're watching us online, wherever in the world you happen to be. I think we've had most countries represented in some of our events, so maybe we'll pick up another uh, couple today. Some of you, I'm sure, know Jesus College extremely well, but for those of you who don't, you are very, very welcome. There is an amazing history to this place. Initially set up in 1144 in the fields outside the small town of Cambridge. This is not part of Cambridge, this is away from Cambridge. Um, this was a nunnery, and for many hundreds of years it, it had a thriving existence. Um, 1496, the Bishop of Ely came to see how things were going, and he said that there were two nuns left. One of them was rather elderly, and the other was of ill fame, which you can interpret however you like. Uh, but the bishop decided to kick both women out and turn it into an all-male college, an error we have since fixed. Um, and over those hundreds of years, as a nunnery and then as a college, there have been people here who have thought, who have written, who have tried to go on and change the world. There are people such as Cranmer, who wrote the Book of Common Prayer and created the Church of England. Uh, Malthus, who wrote about population and made really quite a difference in uh, how places like China uh, and many others think about themselves. Uh, Lisa Jardine was our first female fellow and an absolutely amazing uh, polymath really phenomenal uh, and inspirational woman. Uh, and then more recently, there have been lots of others. Jason Forbes, the, the sort of comedian and actor. Uh, do any of you know Clean Bandit and Rockabye? This is an age profile testing for the audience. So, so they, they were all students here. So there's been lots and lots of others. The Intellectual Forum was uh, set up a few years ago, more recently than the college, to try to get people to think and talk about some of the key issues of our time. So we've had a series of absolutely phenomenal people here. Everybody from Jimmy Chu and Ai Weiwei, uh, John Burko just recently, Ros Atkins from the BBC. And I'm delighted to welcome back one of those star speakers. Uh, so uh, Chris uh, did an event for us during COVID online. Uh, so it wasn't quite the same as actually having him here. But I'm also delighted that he's... Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know what was below the waist. So, uh, uh, um, but um, but uh, you normally get heckling from the audience, not from the speakers. But, um, but it, it was a phenomenal event. But I'm particularly excited because Chris has just agreed to be a visiting fellow here at Jesus College for the next three years. So we'll hopefully be coming uh, more often. So this is the first time I get, to, probably the only time I get to welcome him to his college. Uh, and it's great to have you here. Chris hardly needs any introduction. We're going to have lots of conversations here. Um, he was a, obviously an Olympic cyclist. And how many here re people remember Barcelona 92? All right, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK, so there's a few people who are there. Um, uh, uh, you know, or we could look at the Tour de France wearing the yellow jersey. And I think with the drug disqualifications, you ended up winning overall for a few years, didn't you? I think by, <laughs> by the time we cleaned it up, I think I was probably coming out on top, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but is also well known as a commentator through Boardman Bikes and through his work actually now working on active travel, promoting cycling, walking, first in one region and now nationally. Uh, and Chris, it's really, really great to have you here. We're going to have a sort of conversational style rather than forcing you to give a big, long, long speech at the beginning. But just to start off with, you chose this as the image uh, that you'd have behind you. Do you want to say a little bit about why this is how you want us to think about cycling? I did. Um, I'll stand up for this bit, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris, I think some of the, the, the biggest problems that we face is uh, small answers that, that are going to get us there. And this was actually taken by a friend of mine um, in Amsterdam. And um, it's a really simple street shot. And I think we could probably not speak this evening and just go that. That's it. And so I think it was 211 miles from our capital, I did actually look, because I'm quite geeky, that 60% of kids get around like that. And it's nothing, they're not doing it for their health, they're not doing it for, for, um, for, for any greater good, they're just doing it because it's easy. They're doing it because it's easy. And while they're doing that, they're making zero carbon journeys. They're looking after their own health without thinking about it. They have transport independence, which makes a massive difference to lives. And it's just there. And we haven't got that. And that's 211 miles away. And that's not right. So my journey with bikes goes back an awful long way to 
first of all, it's, it's your, my first form of transport and extend your territory, and then it's a way to meet girls, and then it is your passion and a job, and then I was 32, and it changed. The beauty of this machine is it changed, um, and it could be different things to different people or uh, different things to the same person at different points in their life, and now it's my way to, uh, to explore. Um, I, I spend a lot of time, in fact, I intend to live in the Kern Gorms, uh, as much as possible. It's a way to go and explore territory and then I'll come home and it's a way to get to the station. And that's pretty bloody amazing that we've got one thing that can do all of that. So it's the simple answer hidden in plain sight and the fascinating challenge that we have now and one that I'm constantly wrestling with is not the facts and the data, we're drowning in that stuff. Or, or to put it another way, it is the foundation to build anything meaningful but nobody buys a house because it's got great foundations. Nobody even talks about foundations. But that's often in the world of trying to get more people cycling. What we do, we talk about the foundations, when really people make big decisions based on emotion. And we see it all around us in the world. You can go as, as far as you know, a Donald Trump to how, you know, how does the, the, these things happen, get the followings that are entrenched and behind because they've connected with people's emotions. And I think that's the next step for us that we stop talking about cycling and the stats and the data. Actually, I'm going to talk quite a lot about data <laughs> as, as we get going. Um, but we, we talk about what it gives us, transport independence, freedom, uh, nicer places to live, cheaper travel, all the things that, that the people who probably aren't sitting in this room care about because it's what they think that matters, not what, what we think. So it's a fascinating journey. I've ended up... Um, uh, setting up a government agency last year, Active Travel England, uh, which was brilliant. Uh, we went through the prime ministerial churn, uh, which has been quite a lot of fascinating challenges, actually, one after the other relentlessly. Um, but we're still here, actually, and we're in really good shape because we found, started to find common language. So I'll stop there because we'll probably get into a lot of this. But um, I think that's the reason I chose this picture because that's the point of this conversation, and that's why I wanted it to be there while we're having a conversation this evening. Okay, and we, we can also stand up, if you prefer, an active conversation well, rather than sitting. What would you... Let's, do, let's, do <laughs> let's see how it goes. Yeah. So, so there's a really interesting thing, because you talked just then about the government and how it's changed, and some of the narrative at the moment seems to be about reducing the war on drivers. How are you finding the messaging that you can give fitting in with that? Just trying to think where to start with this. Um, because the answers for me are a long way back. Um, some of them were in a wind tunnel, maybe we'll get to that. I mean, the wind tunnel taught me how to deal with councillors, um, but maybe we'll get to that story in a minute. <laughs> but uh, you kind of skip into the end, really. But, so the plan for drivers is, it's, it's, it's very political at the moment, um, but we have, we have common ground in that we have kids, we, have, um, we, we all want choice, and, and that was the language that we found worked for me over the last year is we're not trying to get more people cycling and walking. We're trying to create, give people more choice. And people go, oh, I kind of want choice because that's, that's a core thing that we want, the choice to choose. Uh, so we're talking about giving you more choices rather than taking something away. Uh, the difficulty is making sure that gets into the narrative. Um, and I did um, some calculations about two or three years ago, actually, when I was working for Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester, where I was Active Travel Commissioner and then Transport Commissioner, um, stitching it all together, where we worked out that the people who rode in that city region now, which is a fairly small percentage of journeys, but nevertheless, if they all chose to drive instead, it would fill the M60 ring road, nose to tail, all three lanes in both directions. So we are the plan for the driver. <laughs> you know, what does a driver need well, more space would be great. How do you get more space? Less people driving. Why would people drive less? Because they have other choices. So it's, it's actually connecting people to that. It, it's really, I mean, many years ago when I was involved with things here, we used to jokingly suggest to have a one day a year, have a drive to work day. So look, if all of the cyclists and pedestrians <laughs> just drove that day and prove how bad the gridlock would be. I mean, I think we didn't do it for, for various other good reasons. Well, a lot of people don't have cars either. It's just yeah. Well, indeed. Well, you'd have to. Well, I suppose it'd be quite an involved exercise, but. Um, <laughs> but one way to make the point, as you say, that active travel is about helping the entire transport system. 
How much do you find it also as a message about helping individuals, that, you know, fitness? Is that a compelling message as well? I would say, I would say not, because I, I think we're back to logic there, and that's not how we make decisions. I mean, I'll tell you the wind tunnel story, because it's relevant. It's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit long. Um, but uh, well, I ran a research and development program for the Great British Olympic team, and we were wonderfully given million pounds to go and experiment we had to have no viable no commercially viable product at the end of it we just needed to make people go faster absolutely brilliant and we spent up to a week a month in wind tunnels which is 90 percent of the energy that you expend as a cyclist as most of you know is pushing air out of the way uh, so we spent a lot of time here and my cunning plan was we'd have this little group of experts and they'd have great <coughs> ideas and then we'd keep it secret because we were finding some amazing things and then we'd take it to the team and then they'd go faster and win gold medals and that was the idea so we went through, we kept a really tight group kept all the information uh, closely contained and then I went to one of the qualifying events for the Olympics we're back going back to 2000 and 2004 now so uh, no sorry 2007 and gave the athletes it was in Holland a World Cup event where they're trying to qualify the Olympics high stress gave all the athletes the equipment told them what the numbers were, this is going to make you go faster. Went and sat in the stands to watch the competition, job done, and I watched 80% of them carry on doing exactly what they were doing before. And I couldn't believe it, I couldn't believe it. We'd, we'd given you the recipe for success, we'd given you all the tools, to do. we'd given you the data, the evidence, and you carried on doing the same thing. And in my um, arrogance and ignorance then, I completely railroaded through the point that they were so emotionally invested in what they did and they'd spent blood sweat and tears trying to be as good as they could for years and then somebody had come along at a high stress point for them and said uh, don't do it that way do it this way um, I watched this competition and the 20 percent of people who had taken all of the things uh, on board were the ones that had helped us with the experiments so the, the penny finally drops and we rushed back to Southampton where we worked, we cut a hole in the ceiling of the wind tunnel, put a projector there, we put uh, live data on the floor in any language that the athlete wanted, could be power, could be time saved in their event, whatever they wanted, and then we got the whole Olympic team down, put them in there one by one and didn't tell them anything, just let them play. And then they started asking questions and the experts we had would answer the questions and then they started asking for advice. They said, well, why don't you try riding this position? They tried that, and they could see the numbers change, and they could see the cost of doing something or not doing it. And, and each of them spent probably about an hour in the wind tunnel. And by the time they'd finished, uh, they'd all adopted the things that we wanted them to do. But now it didn't belong to us. It was their choice, including the choice to do nothing, because they were going to own the outcome. So quite a few years later, when I went to work in Greater Manchester, I remembered that lesson when I went to speak to each of the 10 boroughs and they were expecting me to sell them something and I said, listen, it's costing you 3.75 billion to travel in this region at the moment. You are spending two million pounds a month treating inactivity alone, costing 800 million uh, a year for uh, collisions. Um, if you can live with that, fine. Oh, and you're not going to meet any of your decarbonisation targets unless you drive a third less. That's as it is now. Are you okay with that? No. Do you want some other options? Yes. Um, okay. Well, we went to each of the boroughs with a blank map, gave them the pens, and said, right, where do you live? Uh, and we did, I did this 10 times. It's the same exercise. Where do you live? I oh, live here. Would you ride a bike outside your house? And they're kind of looking around. This is a trick question. <laughs> yes. And go, okay, well, would you ride to the, where's the shop there? Would you ride to the shop? No, why not? Well, I get to the end of my road and there's something in the way, generally a busy road, could be a canal or a train track. Okay, well, what would you need to get across that? Well, I need a bridge or I need a cross. Okay, just draw that in. Uh, where else do people go? And they plotted that. Where are the schools? And which are the routes that people would take? And they, over the course of an hour and a half, and they, each borough chose who was in the room. It was local people, it was councillors, it was leaders, it was engineers. They chose. Over an hour and a half, we watched them going from this to this, to leaning forward, to really get involved. Um, and by the time they got to the end of the period, you could see them going, this is, 
bloody hell, this is possible. And they created their own draft map. And then we said, OK, can we take that, put it together with everyone else's, and just put it online? Not as a proposal, just put it online and let people comment. And to their credit, they said yes. So um, they put it online, and within a few hours, we had uh, 4,000 comments. And the biggest complaint was, where's ours? So it went from a 1,000-mile plan to a 1,800-mile plan with virtually no objections whatsoever, and, uh, and we didn't touch the pen. And that bit was key. The choice to do nothing was key. It had to be. You don't have to do anything, but you have to live with the consequences if you do nothing. It's up to you. Now, it's not all roses, so then you start to implement, and you go, what do you mean you're going to take the car parking <laughs> space? And then it starts to get sticky. But people could see the big picture and were proud that this was our plan. We've got, this is the biggest plan in the country. This, and, uh, and they had something to own. And the mayor, Andy Burnham, was very pleased because he could stand in front of it and say, well, that's, that's ambition. And he wasn't getting a political push on that because everybody had chosen this for themselves. And now it's being delivered. Um, but the lesson learned in the wind tunnel was it's whoever owns the outcome gets to make the choices. And that, if you, give your, if you free yourself of the outcome, you don't own it, it's not yours. You own the questions, not the answers. And it doesn't have to make life easier. That was quite a long answer to that question, so sorry. But it, but it is a lovely story. And you know, I remember when we first met, I think you were campaigning with British Cycling. Um, the difference in that take of imagine the future rather than tell people what they can and can't do really is quite a clever thing. I know there are people here who've done a lot of sort of traffic planning of various kinds. Um, mm. you know, definitely some lessons here. Just out of interest, what, what fraction of that 18... 100 mile scheme Very slow well we, have, we went through the same process as London did which is first of all you've got to mobilize the people do not exist to design this stuff and that takes time to get going so it is literally now that it's starting to ramp up they are probably 100 110 miles in if that at the moment and it takes time but they're starting to get bits that are all linked together now that actually make a difference there's a, a geeky design they call the Cyclops Junction where you can turn right and never in, interact with traffic. Um, and the lights are activated, not on a button, for you to go around in one movement. And um, that's, that's, that's working out really well. I think they've got 14 of those in there. And so kids can actually get, even in a busy place, kids don't ever have to interact with traffic to get to schools. Um, just one, I think, final question for me, and then I would like to open it up to people here and have a proper discussion with everybody. It's the wonderful thing about that format. Sorry, I've got and my back to you as well. I've got to, I've got to look at you or look that way. <laughs> um, and and if you're online, sure. please do use the Q&A feature on Zoom, and you can ask questions, and I'll, I will read them out uh, as we go. And you can be anon anonymous or not, as you like. Um, Active Travel England it took a lot of work to get it to exist. It's now a thing. What does success look like You know, in five years, ten years... How will we know that it's been a triumph? <laughs> um, I mean, that's why I put it there for exactly that reason. Um, we're we're going to see success in pockets. Um, I mean, I, I love the fact that Cambridge, oh God, we've been doing this for years. <laughs> you know, it's, it's already there. And you know, obviously Oxford. And I discovered a, a school um, just outside of um, oh, Norwich, Kesgrave, where... Um, 61% of kids ride school every day. Mm. I thought it was some kind of error. And I said, that's not right. Said, yeah, yeah, 900 kids every day. So I actually had to go and see it. And they'd inherited a 1930s bike path. And then they built the, all of the housing estates around rather than over and added to it. It wasn't pretty. A lot of it was shared use. They got a horrible 80s underpass to get to the school. But it made it the easiest way mm. to get to school. And so people just did. Uh, and that's the, and those examples are there, but they're not visible elsewhere. And because we're very parochial, conversation I was having earlier, we, we need examples that we can we can relate to. So I, I spend a very little time talking about Holland or Denmark, any of that stuff, um, because it, people can't emotionally relate to it. So it needs to be an example that people can uh, can understand. Well, we'll see it in pockets. Was the was the answer to your actual question? <laughs> Yeah, and, and, I, and I hope we will see that idea that, you know, if it can be done just down the road, it clearly can work here. It's not. Well, it's the Greater Manchester experiment writ large um, now. Um, we, I mean, that was, a, if you like, a regional pilot. 
So I think the best thing that we, we did, and um, some of you may have interacted with this, so maybe I'll get some feedback and tell me, tell me it's wrong, but we, um, we had a capability rating for the whole country, every local authority, and we said, rate yourself. And we put the questions out there. One I'd learned in Greater Manchester, so we had one district, which I won't name, <coughs> Rochdale, um, <laughs> um, and they said, we want to do it um, all of our high street, and they put this beautiful rendering in of the high street, and we went, wow, that's serious ambition, and it looked fantastic, and it's going to cost 20 million pounds, and we earmarked 20 million pounds of our budget to do this uh, urban project. Um, and what I'd completely missed is they hadn't got councillor support, um, they had got one person to do the design work, um, and so they hadn't got anything that was required to, for this thing to actually be delivered. Uh, and so that grounds were whole, everybody underspent, uh, it was just, it was messy and it didn't work. So we remembered that when we came to doing capability ratings, and it's capability rating, it's not whether you're good or you're bad, it's just where are you now. Um, where political will, leadership is the first one. And it wasn't a letter that says, I love cycling, I do. It was, how many people have you employed? Do you have a network plan? Uh, what have you actually done before? And it was all the practical thing, well, that's leadership if you've got that. And if you haven't got that, that's fine. But there's no point trying to do something huge because you'll fail. But what you can do is deliver these crossings around schools. Nobody objects to crossings, really. Put the crossings in around schools. <laughs> okay, obviously, nobody objects to crossings. <laughs> um, uh, let's say they're low noise. Uh, do it around schools. You actually enable more people to get there on foot. And you can win, and you can do it quickly. Um, and we'll train your officers. <coughs> So it's a different type of support. Or as a Greater Manchester or Andy Street in the West Midlands, they go, we want to do this. And you go, well, we've seen the other stuff you've done. You've got 60 people working on this now. Great, crack on. So, and that's, that worked well. And it created, um, it's created positive peer pressure. Because I think everybody rated themselves, and then that was moderated by um, the Department for Transport with historical data they held. And it pretty much mirrored it was OK. There wasn't many who were trying to uh, pull a fast one. Um, we, we created a condition where everybody had agreed with the, the exam questions and some were really quite pissed off that they'd been classed as zero or one. But they were, they were irritated and frustrated, not at us, because that's where they were. And, and the next question was, right, how do we not be that? And so you, try, you had positive peer pressure and uh, everybody had a way to get better. Everybody has a way to win. So we're just going through that rating scheme again now, um, and there's a clamour to be better, but not just to be seen to be better, to actually be better. And that's exactly what we want. So that combined with creating some hot spots and going, look at this, it works, look at this, it works. And most of the regional mayors are on board because it solves a lot of their problems that they've already facing. It is the, even if you don't like um, cycling, well, most people are fine with walking, but even if you don't like cycling, You've got to deal with decarbonisation, you've got to deal with population health, and big list. This is your least shit option. We're going to get t-shirts made. With that because, because even if you don't like it, when you actually look at the things you've got to do, here's your cheapest, quickest way to deal with it. So cycling walking, the least shit option. Is exactly, that's a t-shirt. I, I can say that loudly. And, you know, I, I don't want to talk about any particular schemes here in Cambridgeshire that you know, were designed without enough support. <laughs> we, we might come on to that later. Um, I would love to hear thoughts and questions here. I, you know, I, I, I could chat for ages. We have a time uh, before. Um, so, just kind of, so if the team can just be ready. So we have questions either at the top or at the bottom. Can I start over here? Um, thank you, Chris. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what a walking and cycling commissioner can bring to the party in sort of developing these things. Um, in the context of Cambridge, you, you may find if you're spending time here, the city has four separate tiers of local government and no walking and cycling commissioner, and at times that seems a bit dysfunctional. Well, it's, a, it's, um, it's certainly no magic answer, that's for sure. Um, and, it, and at the moment, there is no even a template remit job description for the role. Uh, I've actually written one, and it's just sitting on my computer at the moment. Um, but it is entirely, that person is there to enact the will of others. And uh, if they don't, are not given a mandate, then it's pointless. If, and and it's, it's very much in its infancy at the moment. So the first thing I did was um, when Andy Burney, Burnham called me and said, will you do this role, is I spoke to Andrew Gilligan, who was the 
uh, Boris's active travel commissioner and then transport advisor at number 10 and said, what do we need? Um, and he gave me three pieces of advice. So the, the first one was don't set a big region-wide <coughs> target. We will get it. He said, it's so big, it will take you a long time. Uh, judge each scheme as it goes in. You know, what has that done? What has that done? And then you'll be able to show progress and you can win at that. So that was one piece to the side. But the main, most important bits were um, you've got to be speaking for the boss. So in my case, Andy Burnham, you've got to be, this has got to be his mission, not yours. And you've got to have some, in some way, control of the cash. So you don't buy white line infrastructure. You know, you, you can control the standards. Maybe we'll touch. We've got some new data actually that's just out why that is unbelievably important. So I called, um, I called Andy Burnham back and said, listen, it's going to be your mission, not mine. And I'm going to need to have some kind of way to steer the cash. And without hesitation, he went, yep, yep. And then I thought, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that was the next five years of my life gone. Uh, I painted myself into this corner. <laughs> but the, the key was um, I was his on, envoy. envoy, envoy. Um, I was the person speaking for him. And there were, when it, get, it got a little bit sticky on a couple of occasions, Andy would say, defer to him. And that, that, that kind of tacit uh, approval was so important. So if... if uh, it's quite a long-winded explanation, but quite important. It can be pivotal, but it depends how empowered that individual is to, to act. Um, I think it can be a good idea to go between different parties, somebody who is not political and not an officer, somebody who is empowered to be the go-between and join things up um, and speak to the public can be helpful, but it's not the be-all and end-all. It's what the local uh, key opinion leader, I would say, because it's not always the top person, it's different in different structures. Uh, th their opinion is the most important. Um, just to be clear, you don't have to be male to ask a question. Um, you know, and it would be lovely to have a bit, of, bit more diversity in who's asking the questions. I'm just, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, at the front here and then. Just to make sure we've got that diversity. Um, we're hearing about some big, bold plans for our region to potentially triple the size of, of Cambridge, you know, 250,000 houses coming. Um, you've already said it's hard to get enough skilled people to deal with some of this work. Aside from all the other issues of growth, how on earth can we make sure that what's coming our way, if it does come our way, ends up with that? Uh, the... The language, and we'll talk about this a lot, I mean, this is my opinion, I mean, there's more, probably more I can learn from you than you could learn from me, actually, the, the work that you do. Um, the language is the most important thing, and the fact that the outcome that you want is um, something that everybody else values. So uh, it might not be, I mean, health is, we all know that we should, we should do more exercise, but we don't because we just do easy. So we have to think about what does the other person want, and is it the easiest solution? Or is it scary to not do it? So fear and greed are your you know, archetypal motivators. You, you've, um, we're, we're a statutory, I'm just trying to decide where to go with this. So Active Tab England is a statutory consultee in the planning system. We have been since June. We've now uh, reviewed a thousand designs. Um, and we have seen the quality improvement from the start to now 500% in the quality of designs. Once people have got a feel for what it is that you'll, you'll agree with. Um, we went in quite softly with that. It's allowed us to talk to developers and see what people need. And I think there's some opportunity now to think about, well, a developer wants to save money and time. A local authority wants to deliver houses. They want, you know, that's, they, they want to get it done with the least objections. Um, and, and obviously cost. The cost of something is, if you're going to get, is it section 104? 106. 106. Depends on which conversation I'm having. Uh, so 106 cash, so you either want to um, have less of it, developers happy, or you take the same amount and you use it for something better than building roads. So if you uh, have quality cycling infrastructure that's genuine joined up from where people live to where they want to go, and you in some way, and this is new, so the, the mechanism for this isn't necessarily there yet. So it might be in Greater Manchester where they're going to franchise buses, where you can say, right, I'm going to have a bus service here. It's going to run every 15 minutes, and it is going to be there. So you've got two things, ways that people get around. Therefore, these houses are likely to have cars, uh, but possibly one, because we have 
tra we have satisfied transport needs in another way. Therefore, you don't have to build a slip road. Uh, you don't have to widen the curves on all these junctions. Uh, you massively speed up a development by not having to do that big infrastructure work. Um, uh, you, you make a nicer place to live. The developer's happy because it's quicker, gets delivered quicker. And I think there's potential there, and I'm watching politicians leaning forward when I'm, forward when I'm talking about this, go, ooh, quite like to stand in front of that. That sounds fantastic. So that's the opportunity that active travel offers to people who are like, not already in this world. Uh, and then they get the spin-off benefits of the health and the, and the and decarbonisation, which you know, most regions have got legal targets to meet. Um, and they ain't going to do it unless they drive 30% less. I've not seen a study yet that's not between 25 and 30%. And the only way people are going to do that is to have other options. So there's lots of different reasons and um, what's the most pressing. And I quite like to go at the same time as that and say, and what happens if you don't? What I mean, London's not investing in active travel out of any kind of um, benevolence or reason for you know, social good. They're doing it because it's space. You know, it's an incredibly space-efficient way of moving people around. Um, and more and more other areas are going to find the same challenge. Um, I'd like to bring in a question from online. I, I have seen various hands, and I'll try to fit in as many people as I possibly can. Um, one question online is about the culture for cycling to school and work. Um, you know, you've got this wonderful picture here. In the Netherlands, generations are brought up with it. How do you make it a cool thing to do? Rather, because, because this person is saying, I fear it's more than just accessibility to safe routes. How do we make it fashionable to cycle? Well, I'm, 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 you know, I should have caveated this right at the start by saying, I don't have all the answers. I just managed to find myself in this job, and I seem to be getting away with it. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the first thing you've got to do is make it easy. It's my favourite word at the moment, is easy. Because that's how we're built. Um, this picture is part of a deck for... Uh, like the talk I've got to do on Friday. And I've got a picture I, I took once just walking around uh, in London of uh, a path that goes around a corner and there's just a muddy strip. And it's only about that, it's like not even one metre. And I looked at it and I took a picture of it because I thought, that's us. You know, we will do the easiest thing possible, even if it's our own, that's how we are built. It's junk food, it is how we travel, it is, you know, cutting off that corner to save. 0.3 of a second because that's what we do. So we've got to make it easy. We've got to make it easy and attractive. It certainly feels safe. Uh, but I kind of wrap all that up in easy, really. So you've got to be able to look out of a car window and go, oh, that looks quite interesting. Otherwise, why would you get out of a car? But you, don't, you can't do that everywhere all at once unless you get and you just turn the traffic off in a weekend. Then you, 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 you've got to do it in chunks and do it in places and create examples. So Manchester's got Oxford Road, um, the Oxford Road Corridor, which they did a few years ago, interestingly paid for with bus money, actually. Um, and, and that's now just constantly breaking records, thousands of journeys a day on there. And they've got an example they can point to, which makes it much easier for, for other people to give, give away some road space. So I think we've got to make it easy is key. You don't get a culture overnight, you, you change it. And it will only change if you give people a reason to, and that basically make my life easier, cheaper, easier way to get to school. Some stats coming out tomorrow in the Active, uh, Active Lives report, which I can't tell you about, um, uh, but watch out for them because they're really good. Fantastic. There was a question right at the top. Hi, uh, sorry. Uh, we're actually we're making a safer bicycle trader for children. I was just wondering if you um, if you see other technology uh, helping with with getting more people on bikes. Um, I think technology is a factor. I go slightly sideways if I'm if I might uh, answering that one. So I know that um, um, Amazon is now you more and more using cargo bikes. So they started in London, and it's uh, again they're not doing it for any reasons other than it makes utter commercial sense which is good because it means it's sustainable but it's more efficient for them with the van they have reliable journey times because of the infrastructure that's in place they can get really close to the customer uh, and and they have invested heavily now in uh, micro mobility to get things about now they've opened a hub in uh, manchester distribution hub same thing and the cycle lane is their corridor into the city you know it's fantastic um they're doing the same thing in Newcastle. So once you get big players like that starting to use micro-mobility and show actually if you make space, it isn't just for people going to school or to work, it's actually for deliveries now as well. 
and you get multiple voices that are um, speaking to the same agenda for lots of different reasons. Um, and I've been really surprised how many big businesses uh, are very, very interested in this agenda for very practical reasons. Uh, and I've been careful to pull those voices in, not the usual suspects, to actually speak to uh, my political masters um, about why this is a good thing for the economy. There's a question at the front here. Yes, uh, good evening. I um, have cycled around Cambridge for the last 40 years. I came as a very young woman. Uh, it's a wonderful way of getting around. It's an easy way of getting around. It's a healthy way of getting around. But in the last, say, five to 10 years, I have felt increasingly unsafe, mm. more and more unsafe, because I feel the, 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 there is an, quite a lawless chaos amongst mm. the bicyclists, scooter drivers. Uh, delivery bikes, electric bikes, mopeds uh, on the roads. Many of them don't uh, observe traffic rules. They mm. go down the one-way streets the wrong way. They, try, they drive without, they cycle without um, lights. A lot of them look at their mobile phones while they're, dri while they're cycling and so on. So mm -hmm. I think cycling needs to feel, you know, I need to feel safe on my bike. Um, uh, if I want to continue cycling, and I obviously want to continue cycling because it's such a wonderful way of getting around, but no amount of cycling infrastructure, if it's used in the wrong way by people mm. not observing the rules, then you won't get people to cycle because they perceive their cars to be a much safer way of getting around. Yeah, a sense of... be going on, so... <laughs> no, I, I, I know what you mean. I mean... We're seeing an awful lot of change at the moment. You know, at the moment, you can go and buy an electric scooter, but you, it's, just, it's not legal on the road, uh, and it's not legal on the pavement, only on private land, but we're allowed to sell them. So we, we've created a bit of a monster, really. So there's higher scooters, obviously, and they're geofenced, etc. And, an, and I've seen it work really well in, um, in Germany. Um, I was in Munich last year. And it's another client for a bike lane. So in a sense, it's kind of new because not active travel it tends to get people from walking rather than out of a car. So it um, often gets conflated with active travel. So I digress a little bit, um, quite a lot, actually. The, the sense of safety is really important and intimidation. But what we're talking about is a general enforcement of the law, uh, which isn't there. And that's, that's not in my gift, that one. <laughs> I recognize it. Um, I, I think... I think we need to be careful, though, um, when we split out people riding bikes and walking. If we look at um, uh, poor, dangerous, dangerous road use, um, because we've now got used to people in a car running a red light or texting, and we don't see that anymore, poses a massive danger. If we say in the round, um, we'd like to see more um, prosecution of road crime. I think everybody would agree with that. Um, there, there's two questions that we'll take at the back in either order, Esther, whichever one you get to first. Thank you. I'm busy writing a transport strategy at the moment for Hackney to cover the next 10 years. Um, for the first time, we're including mental health. So we've got some great principles lined up and we'll be creating evaluation criteria, etc. But we have it in mind as a test case mm. At some point, we're going to make, have to make really difficult decisions, one of which is if we've got a road that's wide enough for a bus lane or a cycle lane, mm. what shall we do? I noticed that Cambridge um, prefers cycle lanes and doesn't like the idea of having people cycle mm. in bus lanes. Traditionally, in Hackney, we've been quite happy to have cyclists in bus lanes. So I'm very interested to hear how you would balance between those two. Well, space is a choice. I mean, also touching on, on your, um, uh, your points just a moment ago, there's 12 billion more miles being driven around homes now than there were just 10 years ago, uh, and the cars have got bigger. Uh, so the space has become compressed and compressed and compressed, and that's also part of the friction as well, and also a fight for space. But they're choices, um, and, and I think you, will, you choose which one is going to get you... Um, deliver the outcomes that you actually want more of. And I, you know, I, would, I would say, if you, in climate change alone, the, the only way you were going to get to meet your carbon targets for transport, which is a big ask, uh, is buses and bikes. They are the only things that you can afford and do quickly enough. So they shouldn't be fighting against each other. In fact, active travel, when I uh, 
played that part in Greater Manchester, we managed to get the local um, people involved with local transport to realise that active travel is actually part of public transport. Because if I come out of my door and it's really hard or it's difficult to get over there, or it's dark, and, or I've got to walk a long way around to get over a bridge to get to a bus, I'll just get in the car and then you have no customer. You know, every bus journey starts with a walk. So it, it's, it's a really important part of, um, of the whole holistic transport offer and it needs to be holistic. Um, I mentioned before about uh, tough decisions and what often has happened in the past is well we'll just narrow this down or we'll just change it to a white line for this bit. Oh, this junction's really difficult so we'll do this lane and then we'll pick it up on the other side. So that kind of thing happens. Well the stats that we've just done now um, and we've We've looked at 100 schemes that were built to what is now LTM 120 standard, so the proper safety standard. Um, and they halved deaths, halved deaths on those routes, and uptake uh, was 20% higher in areas where you had quality infrastructure. Where people went, oh, it's too difficult, and did it the old way with white lines, you, uh, you in increased the likelihood of death by 10% increased it and there was no increase in uptake in active travel when you did some white line infrastructure. That's a big thing if you're a council to know that because at some point that can come back to you when you're standing in the dock uh, with an accident that you've got to build quality. Now the instant possibility for that is well we just won't do anything but actually you'd be better off doing nothing than doing it badly but at least we're starting to lean into this now. So uh, that was quite a long answer, and it wasn't an answer, um, because you've just got to cho choose. Um, you've got to choose, you know, what, what do you prioritise? Because I bet you there's other things in that mix that you haven't put in there other than the bus. I bet you there was private car use. I bet you there is um, maybe a two-way lane rather than one way. That there are other options. You go, oh, but I, don't, I can't do those. That's a, that's a self-imposed barrier, not by you, but there's a, another choice there that's impacted and you have been squashed down to its buses or bikes. And I think it's a bit of a false, false dichotomy, perhaps. It's bigger than that. There's a question right at the back there. I'll try and fit in as many as possible, but it's going to be a challenge, I can see. Sorry to go back to what the lady was saying over there, but about culture. I travel extensively in the Netherlands and in Germany, and I find when I'm walking in Germany that um, the pavements have a, a designated cycle route and a designated walking route. So the drivers actually live in complete harmony with cyclists yeah. and ped pedestrians and cars because near the twain meet, because you know where you're walking, you know where you're cycling, and you know where you're driving. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really pleasant over there. And the same in, in the Netherlands, you have these designated routes and the drivers res respect them and the people respect them. And I think we need a lot more respect over here. They, have, um, they also have uh, presumed liability, so there's, um, there's jeopardy in it. If you behave badly, everybody has a duty to protect them, those more vulnerable themselves, which I think is, um, it is hugely helpful. So you know, if, you, if somebody on a bike hits somebody who's walking, then, then they are liable. You know, their insurance is going to have to pay up and so on up the chain. I think that's a very civilised way to go about it. Um, just as a point, we uh, Active Travel England and LTM 120 won't fund shared use because uh, it creates conflict, except in very rare circumstances where you might have a bridge and uh, it's in a rural area or there's, there's very rare circumstances, but we're protecting that term rare, we're really underscoring that, that it isn't like, okay, well, it's not possible. Because whenever I see that in any document where possible, it basically means it's not going to happen. That is it. If it gets even marginally harder, it wasn't possible. Um, so we're, we're hold, hard in, holding fast on that one. But uh, we agree. You get a speed difference, you create conflict. And so uh, just while you go up there, a quick question from Bev in Cambridge. How do you deal with the criticism that's often levelled that cycling sidelines those with mobility issues? I don't think it does, but I'd like your views. Well, I think, um, I mean, the disabled groups, so Isabel Clement uh, of Wheels for Wellbeing, who's wheelchair bound, she, um, um, she sits on my board at Active Travel England, and she's absolutely brilliant uh, because she says, this is how I don't have to drive, this is how I can get around in London. And she has a motorised attachment for hers as well. 
Um, and that viewpoint in the conversation is absolutely critical. Not for, um, well, the, the, the disabled community, if you, if, if you can't really clump them together, it's very different needs, but they're often used as a, as a weapon, badly, mm. to, against active travel. Whereas if you go somewhere like the Netherlands, and you know, I've, I've seen people who are disabled, and they can live at home, uh, an elderly who can live at home longer, because they can get around under their own steam. It connects them to local communities. So I think it's, um, it's obviously quite disingenuous. Um, I think the um, people behaving badly while riding a bike um, is a problem, certainly a problem for uh, um, visually impaired people. Um, and although we've actually done, I've done an examination of things like bus stop bypasses, um, and, and we've looked at literally millions uh, and millions of journeys now, 12 million journeys, and no uh, major collisions, like none. But that doesn't take away intimidation. And that, that a journey might not even start because it's a really unpleasant experience, and that's important as well. So it's, um, it's a factor, but often we need that voice in the conversation. And if we, if we design for those needs, then we've automatically designed for a parent with a double buggy or you know, for, for a lot of other people as well. So it's, um, I think it's, well, we, we, we have to, we've got a legal duty to actually include everybody, to be inclusive. And it's, it's actually not that difficult with active travel. So there's a question up there. It's on. Um, thanks, Chris, for everything you're doing, and thanks for coming to Cambridge. Um, the photo could actually have been taken in Cambridge, and if you have an early breakfast and go out to Parker's Peace tomorrow morning, you could see something quite similar to that over and over. They'll be wearing more got, clothes, probably. If you've, those, <laughs> if you've got one of those from Cambridge, then I'll take it. Great. I'm sure we could take you up on that. Um, my question is, uh, in the, the increasing number of academics who study cycling in England uh, or in Britain, don't seem to be interested in Cambridge. I don't think anybody's really answered or ever even asked the question, why do so many people cycle in Cambridge? And I think the answer to that question could, could lead to a lot, of, a lot of insight for other areas, but nobody's ever really answered that. I wondered if you could use your influence. I've tried a few times to persuade them to do that. I wonder if you could use your influence to, to get them to answer, ask and answer that question, if it's answerable. Well, I don't think it's one for me to answer. I think there's people a lot more learned than myself could... Uh could produce a, a working hypothesis, but I think there's quite a lot of factors that have made it, I think it's fair to say, cultural here. You can answer that one if you want, Julie. <laughs> I, I, I think, I, no, I think that there's a number of reasons, and the flatness, the relative dryness, the scale and the size are all factors. I'm sure there's a lot more, though, and it wouldn't be hard to imagine a slightly different narrative where we didn't have the levels of cycling. And equally, I think... Having personally, you know, I wasn't going to talk too much about what I did, but having responsible for some of the designs around here, there's a lot more we still need to do. I mean, it's not that Cambridge is this beacon of perfection that everyone else should copy. Um, we should aspire to being a lot better. So. Um, anyway, <laughs> but, but it would be a really interesting piece of academic work. So any academics here looking for a good grant application? Um, I don't think you, uh, you don't fund pure research like that, but we could, you know, do a joint thing perhaps. There must be a research council interested. Um, I'll just come over to this side here and... Uh, I think this person here was waiting. I'm doing my best to remember everybody who's put their hands up. So. Hi, Chris. So I'm, I'm a campaigner here uh, for cycle infrastructure. I don't, I don't live in Cambridge. I live just outside of Cambridge. And um, one of the biggest challenges that we have is you, you touch on the words, and I'm, I just wanted to, to see what you thought. The rural areas, you know, how do we get people, not, not only the people, but the councillors, the parish councillors to kind of, Say we want this. We uh, we we seen very loads of challenge, you know, around that area. So I just want to see, you know, I've I've heard a while back, you know, LTN is just for urban roads. You know, we cannot use LTN here. So immediately let us disregard it. So when is that rural guidance coming from Active Travel England? Could you tell us more about that? Uh, well, rural guide. We're, we're at the moment. I've mentioned earlier that we are fledgling. You know, a year old. Uh, and a big part of what we're doing is establish our relationship with the Department for Transport. The Department for Transport produces guidance. Now, the trust, the, the relationship is excellent at the moment. And I don't just say that because this has been filmed and going everywhere. <laughs> um, no, the relationship is really, really good. And we are, 
uh, largely driving all of that guidance, but it comes through the department. When it goes into the department, um, gets D and it's good actually, you know, get to DFT badges, then councils and local authorities go, oh, it's DFT, it's a serious thing, and, it, and uh, this is the guidance. So that's a good thing. Um, it does slow down in the machine. Um, it does slow down a lot, and, and often it will have um, ministerial oversight as well for um, whether this is approved or not. So how long have we been waiting for the pavement parking paper to come out now? <laughs> Three years, the study on pavement parking. Um, solving that one is horrendous because we've saturated our streets with cars. There is no easy way out of that one. Um, so we're waiting on quite a few things. What Active Travel England can do is produce guidance notes. So, you know, so we've, we've <laughs> produced guidance notes uh, and, and uh, rural design guidance um, is in the work and, and it will be out in the spring. 